Okay, so I think we can start right now. It will make uh, other participants uh, joining. Uh, joining. Um, so as you know, this session is part of the ICOM and Peer Comes uh, Artificial Intelligence Survival Excellence Series. It's the second webinar. We already had one uh, uh, last week. Um, and so this session is about uh, practical tools for museum communicators. And the goal of this session is really to focus on actionable tools and insights uh, for integrating AI into uh, the everyday museum communications. So we are lucky to have uh, three speakers with us who are going to share their insights and also their return on, of experience on using AI in their everyday practice. So I'm going to let them introduce uh, more themselves, but we have today with us Annabelle Horner who's director of the Museum of Communication in November. So we are really pleased to, to have you today. We also have uh, Wim Van Roy, uh, vice chairman from the World Forum of, for Motor Museums. Uh, it's great to have you since you're, you're also very far away in, uh, in Japan. It's very late for you, so it's great. And we have Brett Crawford, um, PhD and associate teaching professor at Kennedy Mellon University. Uh, so it's very, very happy to, to have you uh, with us today uh, to say maybe a, a very few words about myself because I'm the moderator, so I'm here to be forgotten and let the floor to the, to the speakers. Uh, but my name is uh, Marion Carré and um, as you can hear, I'm French, uh, I'm based in, uh, in Paris. And uh, to say you a few words about what I'm doing, I'm the CEO of a company called Ascona who build artificial intelligence tools for museums. So just to say uh, a few words. Um, so I think we can start with the presentation. So what we're going to do today is search those three uh, inspiring um, presentation from our speakers. And then we have time for Q and A. So we'll start to, to ask questions, but of course you're welcome to share your question in the chat and we're going to take some time at the end to uh, ask it to the to the participants um so so that's uh, that's the plan for for today uh, thank you so much christiana for sharing the detailed view uh, in the chat um so we are going to start with you uh, annabelle um so the floor is yours if you want to to share your presentation and uh, and start start it Okay, hi to everyone. Uh, hopefully you can see the presentation now. Yes, okay. perfect. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Marion, um, for the friendly introduction. And um, today, uh, uh, my contribution to this webinar, I would like to demonstrate the work with AI and its benefits for this museum sector using the example of our New Realities exhibition. So this is, I tried to go on with the presentation. It doesn't work the last time. Oh, no, it's, uh, you know. Um, this is one example uh, um, among many of how we can use this digital phenomenon AI for museums. I would be delighted if we could talk uh, about other possibilities afterwards and after the other contribution. So the content of my presentation is AI in and end museums or in museums, the concept of the new realities exhibition, um, the new realities, how artificial intelligent portrays us was an exhibition in 2023 and its development, new realities, stories of art, AI and work in 2024. And then I try a little conclusion uh, about museums, AI and ethics. And I will show you a little look into the future and the new new realities exhibition. AI and or AI in museums. Artificial intelligence is currently widespread uh, discussion in society, culture and media. Uh, it is a revolution in all kinds of areas and AI also found its ways into museums. While there are often more questions than answers on the impact of AI and its rapid developments, museums can play a crucial role as mediators of this digital technology. 
in working with AI technologies and in addressing societal and cultural implications, the museum can establish an ethical framework for a so-called AI culture as a part of digital ethics. The concept of the New Realities exhibition. Our communication and interactions are already influenced by AI. In the permanent exhibition of the Museum of Communication Nuremberg, AI already plays a role, e.g. in the field of journalism, AI as reporters, AI generated images for news and media and so on. For us in Nuremberg, it was only a small and logical step to a temporary exhibition and we created new realities. But what is New Realities? It is an exhibition with AI-generated photographs in different image series and within different settings. But first, one step back. The use of AI in word and image requires new and adapted forms of media literacy. Media literacy, one of our main goals in our didactic work as museums of communication. And further, we wanted and want to accompany this media change AI is responsible for as a cultural institution. Hence, we created the New Realities exhibition. One of the main ideas, but also the main design tools uh, of this exhibition is reverse remediation, which means linking AI to traditional media. New Realities presents AI-generated media by linking them to familiar formats such as photographs, but as well as other media forms, posters, graphics and texts. This approach allows visitors to understand and evaluate new technologies within the context of familiar media experiences. This means also a low threshold and an approachable access. The first exhibition in 2023 was New Realities, How Artificial Intelligence Portrays Us. This is the key uh, icon of the exhibition. We opened it in June 2023, and these days AI-generated images were a hot topic. We had visitors who had at that time could not distinguish which of the photos were AI-generated and which was not. I'll tell you, they were all AI-generated. The idea of reverse remediation, we choose the setting to the to the to the idea of reverse remediation, we choose the setting as a photo exhibition, white room, classic hanging for the AI generated images. And we also embedded the image series in different stories. The storytelling was important in order to become somewhat independent of the rapid development of the AI technology. In other words, in addition to the new hit AI-generated photorealistic images, it was also important to provide an exciting dramatization of the pictures. Otherwise, it would have quickly become boring for the visitors. So, which means visual continu continuity, photography, and storytelling. In new realities, AI-generated images were presented in a manner that resembles traditional photography exhibition, with its own very own idea of storytelling, tel making these new media forms more accessible and easier to understand. This met methodological approach encouraged visitors to critically engage with the images by drawing on familiar visual practices. And here, finally, some examples uh, from the exhibition. We see here we see two of the series: uh, the so-called hotel images and Arctic images. And here some pictures from the rainforest series. And this year, uh, nearly one year after the idea of New Realities was born, the Museum of Communication in Berlin asked for take over the exhibition. But AI had continued to develop and spread the discussion in the media about challenges. And somebody has his... Uh, thing. Sorry, can you get your microphone? Okay. <laughs> Uh, but um, but AI had continued to develop and spread the discussion in the media about challenges and opportunities were already much more advanced. Nobody was interested in the mere AI-generated image anymore. So we, the curators, had to intensify the idea of storytelling and created for Berlin new reality stories of art, AI, and work. 
critical examination of AI generated realities. The introduction of generative AI is not only a technological shift, but also a cultural one. A huge cultural one, as I used to call it earlier in my lecture, a revolution, revolution comparable to the in invention of the internet. It reflects and shapes our cultural codes and values and has the potential to reinterpret and analyze them in new ways. That's why the focus of the exhibition shifted a little, AI and work. First, I want to introduce you to Karen Howe, a journalist. She investigated about the working conditions of the AI industry. It, the AI industry, had developed new ways of exploiting cheap and precarious labor, often in the global south, shaped by implicit ideas that such populations don't need or are less deserving of livable wages and eco economic stability. For the developed version of new realities, we focused on the story around work, co-work, digital work. So um, this version of the exhibition also shows AI generated images, but we as creators work together with the AI. AI become in some aspects also co-curator, a co-curator um, co-creation with AI was, for example, in assistance, in research, arrange and organize content, coherent story storytelling, or but also in exhibition design. Here you can see the co-working workplace created with the AI in the exhibition. Everything here is made with or in co-working with the AI, from pizza delivery notes, desk yoga exercises, to the new AI United, which is a union for people working in the AI industry. We also created a huge collage with over 170 photos, which shows which shows people working in the AI industry, so-called data workers, or as we call them, the annotators. Here, our digital curator Maren programmed a bot based on ChatGPT4, which in turn spit out answers in form of prompts, voice comments uh, for image AI programs, to the question, what is the dark side of the work of data workers in the AI industry? And we put the prompts in an image AI program, Midjourney, and this was the result, the collage, or so-called the annotators. Perhaps we can talk about this later. For this exhibition, we also created lots of AI-generated photos around work, workspaces, and co-working. Here are some examples. The special thing here, the special thing about the exhibition in Berlin, which was, uh, which could be seen uh, until September this year, it promotes reflection and critique in the reception of the AI art and inspires further thoughts. It encourages guests to reflect on an AI generated content and interpret it to the context of their own media experiences. The exhibition challenges conventional viewing and thinking habits and motivates a critical examination of AI, transformed forms of representation, leading hopefully to a deeper reflection on the role of AI in art and media production conclusion. With the new realities, we wanted to highlight the opportunities and possibilities, as well as the challenges and limitations of AI with an engaging approach through communication and storytelling. We aim to present AI not only through a significant contrast, but also through our common understanding of media. By using a shared understanding of media, we can better discuss visual injustices, stereotypes, cliches, and the biases inscripted in the ANI. As a cultural phenomenon, uh, as a cultural institution, we are called to help shape this phenomenon of AI, key terms, media literacy and media education, and furthermore to co-create a framework of a digital ethics. Integrating AI can create numerous possibilities to bridge accessibility gaps and to engage diverse audiences through exhibitions and interactive tools. But if you are interested in being a museum for all in our increasingly diverse society, you must be aware to use this tool in which stereotypes, biases, and racisms are in script. Then AI can be a powerful tool to build a bridge between science and society and to involve museum practice and theory by digital technologies. And let's have at the end a little look in the future. In 2025, we will show AI 
uh, a new AI exhibition, New Reality Stories about Fashion, AI and Work. This is the working title in the Museum of Communication in Frankfurt with a special focus on the work conditions in AI and fashion industries and visual in injustices in the in AI generated images. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Annabelle, for this very uh, rich uh, presentation. I think we can move forward to the next presentation and we'll take some time for the Q&A at the end. Um, Vim, do you want to share your screen and uh, take the floor? Yeah, absolutely. So you should be seeing my screen at the moment. Yes, perfectly. Wonderful. So artificial intelligence has changed the way museums operate by using advanced uh, technologies like deep learning and image recognition, museums can digitize and preserve their collections, enhance visitor engagement and experience or gain deeper insights into visitor behavior and preferences. With the help of AI powered tools, museums can now automate content generation and creation, creating multiple and that's jumping a bit too soon. Let me jump back. Creating multiple language support and manage their inventory and collections more efficiently. AI is also being used to ensure the security and safety of the museum premises with real-time monitoring and detection of unusable uh, activities. Today, we explored the fascinating world or of artificial intelligence, a field that's revolutionizing industries and reshaping how uh, we understand uh, intelligence. The journey of AI began with pioneers like Alan Turning, who questions if machine could think, leading to the establishment of AI as an academic discipline in the 50s. Since then, AI has experienced uh, cycles of excitement and skepticism, but recent uh, advancements in deep learning and neural networks have uh, brought a new uh, way of thinking into our everyday lives. From virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa to autonomous vehicles, AI is today everywhere. It's not just a technology, technologic marvel, but it's also a social shift influencing um, sectors like healthcare, education, and industry. As we consider AI's uh, profound impact, your role is preserving and presentive correcting uh, narratives, and this is becoming more vital. Thank you for joining me as we explore how this technology can be beneficial in our daily lives. Digitalization and preservation are some of the areas where uh, AI are being used. With the help of AI powered tools, museums can automate the tagging of images and make it easy to retrieve them. Curation is still necessary, but this could be done on the fly. Having some data, even when not fully correct, is still better than no data at all. Optical character recognition like OCR tools can be used to digitize textual context, making archives searchable and accessible. AI technologies can also be used to maintain the uh, condition of museum artifacts by monitoring environmental variables like temperature and humidity. AI is transforming the way we engage with museum visitors creating more personalized and interactive uh, experiences. One key area is the use of augmented reality and virtual reality to create immersive exhibits. Additional conversational AI like chatbots and virtual assistants allows visitors to interact with exhibits in real time. Are you ready to experience a new era in the museums? Conversational AI is at the forefront of revolutionizing how visitors engage with exhibits. This technology with powers familiar tools like Siri and Alexa enables natural human-like interactions between visitors and museum content. Imagine walking into a museum and being able to ask a virtual guide about the history of an artifact or an inspiration behind a piece of art. AI-powered guides can provide real-time personalized responses 
making each visitor's experience unique. The level of personalization uh, goes beyond traditional tours, allowing visitors to explore based on their interest, but still managed by the museum. Moreover, AI enhances accessibility by providing alternative interactive methods. For example, visitors with visual impairments can receive detailed audio description of exhibits, while those with hearing impairments can access real-time captions or sign uh, language interpretation. As AI continues to evolve, it's clear that museums are not just static spaces anymore. They are dynamic environments where the past comes alive, tailored to each visitor preferences and needs. Creating voiceovers based on text becomes now more available than ever. Analyzing data and insights are crucial for museums to understand their visitors uh, and optimize their operations. With the help of AI, tools can um, gain insights into visitor behavior and interest on the website. Predictive analytic tools can be used to forecast trends and optimize exhibits based on museum visitors' data. By analyzing visitors' behavior and preferences, museums can create personalized experience and engage with visitors and also understand the exhibits in a better way. AI power content creation and uh, curation can help museums create engaging and informative uh, content uh, about their exhibits. Tools like ChatGPT, Cloud, Copilot, etc., can be used to generate automated exhibit description, blog posts, and other content based on your artifacts data. These tools can help you to get you started uh, and or have a co-writer to help you create different types of content. As always, just like with a trainee, you should still verify the created content and correct where needed. AI-powered translation tools like DeepL and Google Translate can be used to provide multi-language support for international visitors. By using AI technologies, museums can create content that caters to the needs and preference of their diverse audiences. Try to use crowdsourcing where possible and ask trustworthy people to help you with curation uh, of your uh, content and the checks. Social media and marketing are critical for museums to attract visitors and promote their exhibits. AI powered social media management tools can be used to schedule posts and analyze engagements. More and more tools like LinkedIn, etc., have now built in AI tools to help you rewrite. Sentiment analytics tools can be used to understand visitor feedback and sentiment. By using AI technologies, museums can create social media and marketing campaigns that are tailored to the preference and interest of their target audiences. Inventory and collection management are critical for museums to maintain their collections and understand their value. AI power inventory systems can be used to track and monitor museums artifacts and schedule maintenance and repair if needed. By using AI technologies, museums can improve their inventory and collection management and ensure that their collections are preserved for future generations. Security and monitoring are essential for museums to protect the collections and ensure the safety of their visitors. AI power surveillance and security tools can be used to detect and prevent unusual activities into the museums. In today's rapidly evolving world, the use of AI tools in the automotive museum space presents exciting opportunities, but also raising important consideration. Let's briefly touch on five key areas. Ethical concerns, technical challenges, cost consideration, visitor adaptation, and accuracy and reliability. On the ethical uh, considerations, um, they center around the balance between the human expertise and the machine-driven decisions. AI can assist in curating collections, but there is a risk of um, depersonalizing the visitor experience. Museums must ensure that AI is used to enhance, not replace, the human touch and knowledge that makes museums special. On the technical challenge side, 
integrating AI tools requires skilled personnel and robust infrastructure. Museums may need to invest in training staff or partnering with technology uh, companies to maintain the system, which can be daunting for smaller institutions. There is, of course, the cost considerations. This is following closely behind. Implementing AI solutions can be expensive upfront, both in terms of hardware and software. However, when it comes to a visitor adaptations, museums must consider how quickly and easily visitors will embrace AI-driven exhibits. While some may be excited by AI-powered interactive experience, others might prefer traditional approaches. Designing experiences that are engaging across diverse audiences will be key. Finally, of course, accuracy and reliability are crucial. AI tools must provide accurate information about collection and historic uh, context. Uh, mistakes could undermine a museum's credibility. Ensuring the reliability of AI systems is a vital for maintaining trustworthy with visitors and stakeholders alike. In summary, AI holds great promises for automotive museums and other museums around the world, but successful integration requires a thoughtful approach to ethics, cost, and visitor engagement. Organizations such as the Museums uh, AI Network provide essential resources for museums professionals to embrace the possibilities of AI. Their AI Museums Planning Toolkit offers a practical starting point, especially for non-specialists. With uh, case studies from institutions like the American Museum of Natural History, demonstrating how AI can be used to process and analyze large data sets, such as visitor feedback, etc. The toolkit is um, available in multiple languages and includes workshops and ethical frameworks to ensure robust, responsive AI projects. Additionally, um, the Network of European Museum Organizations, NEMO, has, uh, active, has been actively involved in shaping an EU policy with the cultural heritage sector. NEMO's initiatives, such as conferences and the AI Office, launched by U the European Commissions, offer valuable platforms for curators and directors um, for their daily information and continue AI developments in museums. These organizations emph uh, emphasize not only the operational benefits of AI tools, but also the uh, ethical consideration necessary to ensure that AI tools share the public interest. Museum professionals can further uh, engage with AI developments through platforms like the International uh, Council of Museums, where we are today. ICOM is offering opportunities for professionals to continue their expertises with webinars like this one that we promoted at the World Forum for Motor Museums. Thank you so much, Vim. Uh, I think you had the last slide with the various resources you mentioned. We haven't seen it. Are you able to, uh, to just share it quickly if uh, some of you wants to take some screenshots no. or, or I don't know? Absolutely. Let me grab that back. Thank you so much. Because I think it can be very useful. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Wonderful. So thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. We are going to move to the last presentation from Brett Crawford. So you can go. Thank you, Marion. This has been wonderful to hear everyone's work that they're doing. Everybody. So I think you can see my screen. I want to just take a moment again to say thank you for inviting me. Um, in less than 10 minutes, I want to introduce you to the opportunities you can find using AI and really think about how you can use it as part of your tech stack as a marketer um, and or in your marketing department. I'm also gonna give you a few caveats in versions that you've already heard from my panelists, uh, co-panelists. So, um, the following lays out our time together. I want to let you know that I've been both a marketer and top marketing pretty much all of my career. Um, I've just sort of, it's in my blood. 
And in the last 10 years, I've also been working with and integrating artificial intelligence. As Wim said, um, it's not new, but it has definitely progressed in the last few years. Um, I also want to take a moment to focus on two forms of AI that I find really useful as a marketer. Um, look at sort of the frameworks as marketers, how we can tackle these, go into some specific applications for marketing funnel work, and then consider how you might want to approach AI policies and um, hiring AI vendors. So I personally um, think that you need to really start with machine learning, which is a core part of um, artificial intelligence. I, um, I think we need to use this more and I think we need to use it probably first. I sometimes say we need to get our machine le learning work done so we can really take advantage of some of the generative AI work. So a lot of this we're probably already seeing in our, in our time, right? You can definitely use things like A-B testing and analyze your data, but really I think what machine learning offers us um, the best tools with is the predictive learning that we have from all of our first person data in our CRM systems, right? So it's great at dissecting, analyzing, and using large amounts of data. It's also really good at automations. And I often work with arts organizations and am shocked that they're using almost no automation, either internally or externally, including A-B testing, which is automated. Um, it does take time to plan, but the efficiencies you and your team can get from automations um, in approval practices, or processes and in the actual marketing funnel are definitely worth taking the time. Um, we all understand algorithms. Um, they are also part of this machine learning um, packet and they're part of our daily lives. But I think it's something we can really lean into more um, to create those personalized experiences that Wim was talking about. Um, we can create emails, we can create in-house experiences that are truly personalized using the data from the user user's previous experience. Again, something we don't do a lot, but we could easily automate images. We can pull previous um, social media information from that particular visitor into um, how we're communicating with them in our other channels. But we, of course, are focused on generative AI today. Um, I still, you know, generative AI is one more um, tool that we find in our artificial intelligence world. Um, I like reminding um, folk that 2017 is really when it started to take a turn. Um, prior to 2017, we had IBM Watson, we had Google DeepMind, they're playing chess and beating chess winners. We had Sophia the robot touring around the, um, the globe. But 2017, Google discovered what's called the transformer. And the transformer allowed generative AI to take the information it had analyzed in machine learning, train it in such a way that it could transform into these natural conversations. Um, and so, you know, it hit the main market when OpenAI released DALI and then ChatGPT in 2022. And you see a lot of examples in front of you, most of which are text-based. We heard from Annabelle as well that, you know, we have MidJourney. I actually use Canva a lot in our education space because it's a lovely free to educators tool. I also have Adobe. Like you can, there are a lot of tools that are integrating AI at sort of a higher order right now that is, is very exciting for the, the marketer. Um, so let's get down to this, I'll well, get into this broad view, right? So there are levels of how AI is integrating with marketers. You can, we still have the all marketer path. You know, if you run an analysis using a generative AI tool, it'll sort of interpret like where AI can intersect your work. And there's still a lot of work we do that is um, at the zero level. We have almost nothing that's on the four level yet. We're still in the very early stages of where generative AI can, can take over for us in many ways. Examples of things we can do as marketers, I've mentioned several times A-B testing, probably because I don't see it done enough. Um, AI for generating blog posts, for generating content for our exhibits. Um, again, I'm focusing mostly on sort of the, the funnel for getting people into our spaces. Um, we've seen some beautiful, amazing AI generated image, I, images. I often say that in the marketer's toolkit for an arts organization, we might not need as much AI because we are, you know, museums have a plethora of their own content but we can use AI to help us figure out what content to use best. It's gonna personalize our content communication and it will really help us understand patterns in our CRMs that we truly can't see. However, AI hallucinates, we've heard that before and it is so true, just graded a paper. Yep, lots of hallucinations in there. Um, 
AI has a lot of bias. I run the Arts Management and Technology Lab here at Carnegie Mellon, and um, one of our researchers is about to, we're about to um, publish some piece, a piece that is focused on digital colonialization. And it's both the labor side, the copyright, the language, it is, it's, it's quite broad in terms of some of the biases. And for me, one of the things that's important is to remember the marketer has to be there because all of AI's work is in past performance. It doesn't, it hasn't built in the ability to sort of see trends as they're moving forward. So you really want to think as a marketer, what's the info needed to perform the task? How much oversight does my AI need? What is the dependence um, on the level of the machine's reliance on me to complete its objective? And then how can I be sure that I'm helping the machine improve its work? All right, we're marketers, some of us in the room, and most maybe um, those of us listening later. This is to me one of the more robust images of the funnel. It starts at awareness, then we're moving through our interest, consideration, evaluation down to the purchase point where we get all that lovely first person data. Um, but we also want people to come back, right? So I like focusing at the top of the funnel because that's where we're seeing a lot of um, opportunity with artificial intelligence. So when you're at the top of the funnel, you're either working with um, word of mouth, or with advertising. And that's where you can really leverage the machine learning data that you've pulled from your organization. I know who my people are and what they sort of look like, right? You know what exists about your audience and donors. You can then define goals on our platforms, Google, Meta, et cetera. Let the, um, upload the keywords that you know from your data that will definitely trigger for your audience, not sort of a generic audience. And then let the tool drive. And what I, what I personally like about AI layered into these advertising tools is it wants to solve your problem because when it solves your problem, it makes money. Ergo, it wants to solve your problem. So I have watched our, our, our Google ads improve, our meta ads improve because we're sort of letting it do some of the work for us, but we're still hands-on on it. Um, social media also is great with artificial intelligence. Ultimately, why? Because AI is a better predictor of creating influence and engagement. It's much better at predicting content, creative content and what it's seeing in the, in the greater um, social media sphere versus what you're seeing in your own feeds. It can create content at scale. It can detect trends and adapt. And if you feel like paying for it, it can moderate your comments. Um, again, you have to be very careful. You don't know what it's going to say. It could hallucinate. It can be rude. There are some key tools, some of which um, marketers are already using. Um, Sprout Social is one that is very um, strong in integrating AI. Um, there's a smart moderation tool. These are actually companies. Buffer is a tool. HubSpot, Adobe, we've already talked about. And then you can use other tools like Lately. So if you look up Lately.ai, they work with the humans to sort of sort through your content and um, your competitor's content to help you figure out how to do the work. Um, this is the emerging area for marketers. They're called agents. Um, so essentially, I've given you an example of an agent that's built out on ChatGPT. And um, I can share the link to this should you want to see it. But it's helping you get leads. We all would like to have people, and at least in um, the museums that I'm working with, sign up for subscriptions, sign up for a newsletter. So you can use ChatGPT or other tools with an agent to figure out how to build the, the funnel to get the action that you want. But more excitingly, the systems you already have are creating agents that you can use in-house. And so this to me is gonna be the transformative moment for marketers is we can use generative AI as a um, natural language interrogator of our own data to accomplish the goals we're trying to accomplish. So Salesforce, which is a um, significant CRM system in the nonprofit space, um, recently released, and I know this is happening in other CRMs, the concept of having agents built into the CRM system. So you can actually work with your vendor to figure out what they're building, what they're planning, right? If they don't have anyone, you can actually outsource to some, you can, you can pay ChatGPT to, I mean, OpenAI to, to let them do an in-house agent model on your own data. And you can work with your leadership to determine the organization's AI plans and how you want to grow as an organization, that AI toolkit that um, Wim spoke of earlier. Um, ultimately, however, if we're still in the, um, I would say the adolescence of artificial intelligence, 
Um, it's really good at collaboration. It's great at helping you think through. I would say it's sort of like having my a personal assistant that I don't have. I can say, hey, help me think through this project and it will help me think through it. Um, I can definitely take the time to have it automate some of the tasks that I need to have done. And if I take that time, it can, even now, increase your effectiveness. I will say personally, I think it's a little bit less on the efficiency side because we're still figuring it out. It takes training. It takes practice to get to the results you want. Um, AI policies are what is missing, I think, in many of our cultural organizations. And it's something that um, we now have the toolkit um, provided by WIM that you can start thinking through. What are your data policies? And how will those interact with artificial intelligence, both for the training of artificial intelligence, is it allowable, and um, how you're using it in-house. You also want to be aware of your ethical position. Um, I don't use a lot of OpenAI because of the many lawsuits around copyright for the uh, material that OpenAI was trained on. That's my ethical position. But you have to be aware of that as an arts organization. Um, you have to come up with an actual policy of what is the approved use, approved tool, and, and where are we doing this in our own organization? So that's a leadership in partnership with um, a marketing team's um, discussion that needs to be had. And very um, significantly, when using AI, it's important that organizations use transparency. Museums are one of the last bastions of trust, um, particularly, particularly in, in the country in which I'm currently standing. Um, and that transparency, I think, helps, you know, if you're marking something as this was generated by AI, helps people understand that things are generated by AI and they can interpret things more um, with more context. So ultimately, you're not always choosing your vendors, um, but if you do have that choice, you want to ask very key questions. Does the vendor have a public roadmap? Will they be training your staff or do you have to figure it out on your own? What are their security and compliance um, path path? pathways? Do they have an ethical statement on how they are using training for AI? How are they actually powering solutions? What is the minimum data set they need to actually use their technology in your system, right? Does it even integrate with your system? So these are some questions you want to think about um, as you are picking these particular tools. So with that, I think it's time to stop. And I really appreciate this time to share these ideas with you. Thank you so much, Brett. Thank you all for such interesting presentation. So now I have plenty of questions for you. Uh, I'll also make sure to keep some time for, for questions from the from the chat. So do not hesitate to send them and we'll take some, some time to, to ask them to the participants. Um, in terms of questions, I try not to ask too much question, questions about ethics because the third uh, session will be about ethics. So this is a something that you have to, to keep in mind to make sure to attend to the, to the next session. So the first thing I wanted to ask uh, is that um, in your presentation, Vim, you mentioned various resources and toolkits about artificial intelligence. And I wanted to ask uh, the three of, uh, of you, uh, how did you train yourself to develop your AI literacy uh, skills and to learn how to use uh, those tools? And also, can you share with us some best practices, books, pod podcasts? So Vim, you already shared some of them, but if you have helpful resources to, to share, uh, that could be great. Want to start? I, can, I can start. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, for me, it was something really new when I started to have a little approach to AI in 2023 at the beginning um, but uh, I come from gender studies so for me it was very interesting to get to know Eva Gengler I will post her work in the chat later on she works on a feminist AI approach um, which was really interesting and she also had a discussion group uh, for her white paper uh, about this uh, ethical or, you know, a feminist approach to AI, which was really interesting for me. So I had this critical uh, approach in the beginning before I had the fascination of what AI can do for us in my dreams. Um, uh, what Brett told us or Wim that uh, every guest of the museum uh, 
uh, there will be a yeah a easier approach for them to the museum they can uh, download their mother tongue they can or a sign language or whatever and so go through our exhibitions this is my dream so um, everything digital but also for the real museum visiting uh, or visitor visit um, but uh, i think i have a critical approach to to ai but I'm also fascinated um, for the second exhibition. We also created a code of conduct, uh, this for the theme of transparency to the guests, uh, how and uh, how we worked together with the AI so that everybody uh, uh, um, can see in a transparent way how we work together with the AI. So I will post some uh, also some links to the chat. Yeah, it's so interesting. Please uh, share it with us. And this code of conduct, conduct was something that you uh, shared in the exhibition online. How do you communicate uh, um, on it? Yeah, in the tradition or in the setting of the exhibition, we uh, put our code of conduct in a, a photo book, uh, which lies uh, which which lays in the exhibition. Um, and uh, yes, we also have a so-called expertizer. I think Christy, Christiana uh, put it also in the chat. Um, it's a kind of virtual space. Uh, it's a virtual museum space. Uh, what you cannot do in the analog museum space, we 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 show there in um, in the in this so-called expertizer. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. I can jump in. Um... I started working with artificial intelligence in 2018, 2019, when it was still pre really a public aspect for that. I have um, applied for and received a grant for a smart cities grant to integrate AI for a basically a public art in, um, intersection to activate a greater sense of well being in the city. And so we used IBM Watson. How did I do Training is hard. I, I'm like, I love generative AI, it's so much easier because you have to actually program and train the AI with the, the pieces otherwise. Um, and we took five different um, public art pieces. We created QR codes, attached a chat bot so that anybody randomly walking by or hit with an ad from social media could engage and learn more about the art. And so that was the first time I would say, I, I really actually want to apply for that and do it again now that people A, are much better at using QR codes they re I can integrate more of a generative AI aspect and pull more data in because um, time was a limitation. And yeah, I think it's very exciting in some of the um, learning opportunities that are embedded with um, content, both in public art and in museums. Great. Yeah, for me, it goes back to, to my first steps uh, playing around with, uh, with AWS and, and learning how to do the, the move to the cloud. That was a bit the first tryout. And then once, of course, the, the, the chat GPT started to appear and become more public available, getting a few subscriptions and just trying prompts left and right. Use the tools next to each other and see what is the result if you get here. You can also switch between the different uh, levels and, and uh, profiles that they have. So you can try out some things. And a lot of it is, is trial and error. See, what do I put in? What do I get out? And you can really feel that things are really improving. Um, one of the interesting things that we heard at the World Forum was that one of our uh, museums, they were using a digital assistant to help um, visitors to define how they want to experience the museum. Because if we look at mu uh, motor museums, very often you have the petrol heads who wants to know all the technical data of the vehicles or who won which race, etc. But then some people just come for the stories and they don't want to hear any technical data. And with these kind of tools, you can create a personalized experience. But then other people say, like, the moment I go to the museum, I don't want to use my smartphone. I don't want my kids to be using the smartphone. We are out of that digital space and now the museum is putting us back into that digital space while we want to detox from that digital space. So finding that balance is also an important uh, part of our tasks. 
That's really interesting. Uh, do not hesitate to, to share with you if you have some link about this, uh, this assistance. Um, so if we move from the individual to the organization uh, level, I wanted to ask you, how do you think that museums can prepare their teams to work effectively with, uh, with AI? Uh, Annabelle, you were talking about this code of conduct, and I, I was wondering if you have some return of uh, experience of how at the organization level you can help your team um, use AI properly. We are not doing this, but as Wim, uh, uh, I think Wim was it, uh, um, told us there can be program bots, uh, uh, for example, for newsletters or something like this, which could be very easy. Um, um, we Here in Nuremberg, we have the so-called Future Museum. It's a part of the German Museum of Munich, which is a technical museum, huge technical museum. They are doing their newsletter with an AI bot. So you can use it perhaps in this ways, and we are thinking about this too. Um, for us, uh, I think it's also in the press work or PR and uh, public relation work. Um, um, it's really important to you, or you can use it uh, there. And uh, was this the question, or um, my question was more like, how did you train your team? Uh, ah, so. to make sure that ah, okay. they use AI correctly. Okay, okay. Um, actually, we don't have like rules or written rules yet, but we talked a lot about the about the creating of the new realities exhibition. So we had a kind of oral tradition talking about AI and how to use AI. In some parts of the museum, the the team doesn't use it, uh, and so the te technical departments but everybody who's working with education uh, um, exhibition and uh, public relation they um, so we had this topic in most of our team meetings and we talked about it and we showed the colleagues also the code of conduct I try to uh, find this code of conduct in our in our uh, computer now so I can share it with you uh, but um, yeah and uh, these rules are not written down but we also have like system museums in Berlin and in Frankfurt and we are now redo our digital strategy and I think the part of how to use AI in our museum work will there always also be a part of uh, of this new uh, new written down digital strategy. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add something, Brett or, or Vim, or should I move to the to the next question? My, my team are all pretty much under 30, so it's more of just hands-on, let's figure it out together because I'm, it's part of the ecosystem that I think where they are right now. Okay. I, I think the same here. It's a lot of trial and error and, and try to make it a safe space where people can experiment and talk about what they are learning. Uh, there are no wrong wrong answers. Everybody is learning in this. And, and if you can create a safe space, just make them aware about what are the potential dangers like the biases, et cetera, that they know that they need to keep this in mind. But I think it's a great starter. If everybody who needs to write a text for something, they always have the feeling like, oh, I have this white page syndrome and I don't know mm. where to start. And then you just give it some of your thoughts. It will come, come up with something and it might be not what you were expecting, but it gets your brain going. And then you might just rewrite it completely uh, and there might be nothing anymore left from the original AI, but at least you don't sit there for an hour thinking, what am I gonna write? Interesting, thanks for, for sharing it. And I was wondering, because you, you are talking about this blank page effect and how it can help you. Uh, about AI, we talk a lot about how it uh, helps with productivity and efficiency and things like that. And I wanted to ask you in your everyday life, because that's also the topic of this webinar, what impact do you see on your work or the work of your team? Do, do you see that you really save time or do you see some like concrete impact like this? Yeah, absolutely. If I take an example that's a bit outside of the museum world, but 
I'm making these these uh, online courses. And before we had to make these exams at the end of the course, and that would take for the average course a month to come up with all the questions and rethink it. Now what I do is I just drop in the whole course into the chat GPT, ask it, give me a summary of my course, uh, tell me what the student is expected to be doing at the end of the course and come up with uh, 10 multiple uh, uh, answer questions. Tell me what is the right uh, answer to this question and tell me why. And that gives me, even if I didn't see the complete course, already a view of hmm, here the AI is hallucinating. And then I go back into the course and say, check it double to make sure that everything is matching send it back to the subject matter expert. They will go over the course to make sure that it's completely done. And now in a day we can finish up a course, which before was a month of process. So we, we can quickly see the benefit of this. Great. Yeah, it helps a lot with those processes. I will put, I'm gonna go into the personal space because I thought you also said the word personal. I love mm -hmm. using it for planning my travel. Not plan, not buying tickets, but like, all right, what are like 12 things I can do here? What's the best path to get to here? Or literally what traveling internationally, where can I find parking? <laughs> yeah, that's so, that's the same, same with me. Uh, we traveled to Canada uh, this summer and I was like, where are the, where are some, there was uh, some vegetarians in the group. Where are the best vegetarian uh, slow food restaurants there? And what to see in the Eastern Canada, uh, the Ottawa area or whatever. And for uh, for traveling and planning, uh, plan, planning traveling is, it's so cool. And I really like it. <laughs> so I do, don't Google in, in these uh, in these uh, um, cases, I don't Google anymore. I, I ask uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI. I'm doing a plus one perplexity. Perplexity is amazing. Yeah, definitely agree with that. So I have a lot of questions to ask you, but I, I want to save time for questions in the chat. So maybe I, I'm just asking two less questions. The first one is about this issue of balance, because in your presentation, you talk about uh, the societal and also there is the environmental impact that we know, but at the same time, there is the, there, there are those very positive outputs. And what kind of balance do you, do you see? Um, whether you should use AI or not, depending on the use case, so that that matter of, of balance and good and bad, bad impact. How do you see this uh, this issue and this kind of paradox towards uh, artificial intelligence? I can jump in. I can say one of the pieces that um, it depends on what your what your particular ethical issue is. Um, the I encourage companies to try to work local with their AI, like get an enterprise level. So you're running it locally and you're do, essentially doing what's called a small language model. So you're using your data. You're not necessarily um, triggering chat GPT because it does have a, it has a significant environmental cost. And I'm hearing even my um, students say, I think twice before I use it, because I know every time I ask a question, it, it costs this to the planet. So I, I do recommend leaning in more to the small learning language, large, learn, large lear, learning map, language model, but on a small scale. Yeah, it's the same uh, with uh, with us too. That's why we also shifted the perspective on the new New Realities exhibition, because some people asked us about the ecological problems, not only the economic and the ethical problems uh, around AI. And uh, yeah, that's uh, also a main problem with di digitalization uh, um, in, in general. And that's why that's also one thing we have to uh, talk about when we show the new exhibition, this uh, uh, ecological problems with AI. So I can say, I found the co a code of conduct and I didn't, I forgot that we also asked AI about what to write in this booklet about a code of conduct. I will put it uh, both in the chat, okay. Thank you so much. Jim, do you want to add something? 
Yeah, I think the the environmental impact is is a big part, especially with with the new European rules coming up, where uh, we have to show what is the impact of our organization on the environment, and of course, then we will need to have transparency. And if we don't have a view on on what the cost is of using these tools, it will also have an effect on these reportings. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So my last question is about the future. So let's try to to think uh, about what could be the impact of AI in museums, let's say in uh, 10 to 20 years from now. Uh, what do you hope to see or expect to see in terms of the use of uh, AI? I would say less bias, more... Uh... Okay more generalization, um, make it, making sure that, that things improve, that, that the evolution goes into the right direction, um, that there is good policies around it, that people know how to, to use it as a tool. Um, I think it's very similar on, on how things happened with the internet in the old days. A few started to use it and then when it grew, it went into a certain direction and there is always misuse of the tools. And then hopefully you get some of the good policies to get things uh, yeah, with, with some guardrails to, to keep things on track. Yeah, Thank same for sharing same here. Yeah, I think Europe uh, with the Open AI Act, we, we have an Open AI Act. Uh, we have also data um, data um, uh, act. Um, I think also a di more diverse AI, um, uh, a little bit more less biases, as as Wim uh, uh, said. But also the reg regulatory and the policies must work together with the people using the AI. Yeah, I would. Thank I, you. I plus one, all of those. I appreciate all the public policies that Europe is putting in place because I have things I can teach and sort of show these, you know, it's a start. It's not necessarily the end, so. Thank you so much. Um, so now the floor is yours for the participants if you want to, to ask questions. I haven't seen any of them in the chat yet. But if you want, you can share it in the in the chat or directly open your microphone and camera and ask it uh, to the participants. Um, so feel free to to ask anything. Maybe I can also turn to Christiana. Is there some specific question you want to 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 add? No, thank you. I would like actually to thank you for your presentations. They have been really like inspiring. Uh, my only actually maybe concern is how do you see AI impacting museums in the next uh, in the future, but in the very far future, like maybe in one hundred years from now. Very very perspective one. <laughs> I would say a hundred years from now, it's hard to project, but I think there are some automations we'll see even in 10 years. I'm gonna add the the element of AI we haven't talked about here, which are robots um, and but not necessarily human humanoid robots, but the ability to take all the information about the facility and then have something else take care of it. So I think that the ability to take tickets, um, keep the facility um, and objects in, in a safe condition will change. Yeah, and, and combination of tools eh, where um, now we need to look at a bit, how many people do we currently have into the museum? Um, uh, do we still have capacity? If you look, for example, at, um, at, at Mercedes-Benz Museum in Germany, they really look at how many capacity do we have in the museum and do we need to keep people out? How many tickets can we sell online for the next day? And they, they start also looking at the data, like 
do we see certain trends? Are there certain days that we get more people through the door? And why do we get more people through the door? And how can we participate on that? Do we maybe need to do more marketing on different days? Do we need to do special events on certain days? So I think analyzing the data we are gathering together with AI will also improve a lot in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I think this too, because data is so important for uh, how we yeah how we work together with uh, the communities and also the guests we have. Yeah. Great. So I don't see any question in the in the chat. Uh, maybe everything uh, was uh, very clear and uh, anybody has question. Um. So Christiana, I don't want. I don't know if you want to close uh, this webinar by sharing some, some words. I just want to mention that uh, we are going to actually launch like an AI and uh, museums network uh, with the ICOM uh, comms and uh, we're going to be in contact. Please let us know if you have any ideas about like future webinars. And uh, the third webinar is going to happen next Thursday on the 21st of uh, November. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I want to say a big thanks again to all participants for your brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, thank you also for everybody who, who joined today. And if I'm not mistaken, um, it, this session was recorded, so you'll be able also to, to find it uh, online. So thank you, everyone, and hope to see you uh, next week on the, on the next webinar. Bye. Bye.